So following the principle of explaining at least the title in a lecture, I will start with sort of clarifying some basic notions. And uh, I sort of expect that some of you know some of these, but I figure that it's better to go through them very quickly. So, um, so let me start with the definition of a manifold. So definition, a topological space M is a manifold if it is M2 and T2. So there are two technical conditions which I don't really want to go into and I hope you remember from your poinsett topology lectures. If, uh, if, if every point in M admits a neighborhood U such that U is homeomorphic to Rn. So that's a very basic concept and you know loosely speaking a manifold is a space which is locally like a Euclidean space. And so it turns out that this n, this dimension is a locally constant function and so um, how, how shall we picture this concept? So this is M and we pick a point P there should be a U and there should be a homeomorphism which I will call phi between this subset and Rn. So locally it's fine. Okay, so how can we, so you know we can, we can take all the U's, all the neighborhoods you can find in the manifold uh, with this property. So say this is a U alpha, U B, this is a phi alpha and then there is a U beta also containing this point where now the identification is with some other Rn and now I will use colors. There is an intersection of the two which manifests in two different subsets and you can go from here to there by first going back with phi alpha and then coming down with phi beta. So there is a map which I call G alpha beta which is nothing else than phi alpha inverse composed with phi beta. And that makes life very convenient because from these U's, which we call charts, you can build up the manifold by gluing them together. So the set, such a U, is a chart and their collection is an atlas. It's exactly like an atlas you buy from, you know, about the United States. It's a big booklet and each and every page tells you how to move around in a little neighborhood and there are intersections which tell you how to go from one chart to another. So why did I bring up this notion? Well, first of all, these are basic objects in topology and then you can do something uh, peculiar. You can require these G alpha betas to have specific properties and we will pick one property which makes us able to apply results of calculus in topology. Namely, uh, consider, well, I will start here. So, consider now a collection of U alpha phi alpha with the property that all G alpha beta is um, differentiable. So we have this big atlas and we just pick some pages, some charts. Of course we would like to cover the whole thing. So we want to have a, an atlas which covers the entire manifold but with the property that these transition functions which help you to, to, to transform from one chart to the other, they are all differentiable. Why is that convenient? Suppose we have a function f defined on this, on this topological space. Continuity makes sense, this is why topology is designed, but differentiability in general does not make sense. On the other hand, if we restrict to one chart, to this u alpha, 
then we can compose it with, with phi alpha inverse, and then we get a map from, from this chart, from this Rn to R, and we can ask whether it's differentiable. There is one problem with it, that the notion might depend on which chart we take. If we take this one, this composition is differentiable in that point, but if we take this other one, maybe it's not. Except, if the transition function is differentiable, then you just use the chain rule and you see that you get the notion of differentiability on a topological space. That's very convenient because then you can pull out your calculus studies and use them in solving topological problems. <coughs> the caveat is that in order to do that, you have to fix such a set of charts. So definition, a smooth manifold smooth manifold is a pair M and such a collection of charts where M is a manifold and usually when we talk about general manifolds and we don't assume this extra choice, we call them topological manifold. And this U alpha phi alpha is a system, is an atlas, a system of charts with, well, usually we assume infinitely many times times differentiable uh, G alpha betas. A usual question is, you know, what's the difference? What if we assume, okay, sorry. So this is, this is, these are the objects we would like to study. Um, so there are two very natural questions. The first is question, existence. Does such U alpha phi alpha exist for every topological manifold? And uniqueness is it unique? Of course, absolutely unique, you cannot expect, but is it unique? up to diffeomorphism, which means that there might be a, a homeomorphism of M to itself, which is differentiable in both directions, right? So somehow in this case, although the charts look different, but it's like printed by a different company, you know, it's the same sort of thing, but sort of drawn it in, in a, from a different perspective. So these are two absolutely valid, nice questions, and you would hope that the answer for both is yes, and then the study of topological manifolds can use the entire body of, of real analysis we learned, and the disappointing fact is that neither of them are true. Well, you know, life is more complicated than you would expect. So, um, so let me just uh, recap a little bit about manifolds in low dimensions. So the story starts, I mean, I, I, I want to skip dimension zero. Zero dimensional manifolds are points, and we sort of transform problems about points to somewhere else, like combinatorics, and we don't want to really deal with them. So if the dimension is one, and M is compact, then M is just the same as the circle. It's homeomorphic, it's diffeomorphic to the circle, so we treat it like this dimension is understood. What happens if, dim if the dimension is two? Now we assume that M is compact and there is some other extra technical condition that it's oriented, then M is homeomorphic to sigma g, the genus g surface, which I will try to picture for you a little bit like this. So 
So the surface, you know, the, the way you should imagine is that, you know, what happens for G equals one, you just take a surface of the donut and then you go to this shop where they bake these donuts, but they are like too close to each other and they just bake together. And then there are these multi-hole donuts and the surface of that is exactly sigma G. So how can we characterize these things? Well, in topology, what we would like to do is to associate to objects certain preferably algebraic invariants. And two main invariants are homologies and the fundamental group. So I'm not so sure that you are familiar with what these things are. So let me just sort of state that for these guys, the first homology, which is an abelian group, is isomorphic to, to the uh, to rank 2G free abelian group. So what is H1? What is the first homology? Well, we have our topological space and we take all kinds of circles in the space. Unfortunately, there are too many. We cannot keep track of them, but we introduce an equivalence relation. And two circles are considered to be equivalent if there is a surface between them, there is a membrane connecting them. And it turns out that if we use this equivalence relation, then the space of circles by the operation of taking disjoint union becomes a group. And this is the first homology group. Well, you see that somehow the first homology already detects which surface I'm talking about. The G, the number of holes, is in the, in the rank. There is another invariant which is called the fundamental group. And this is very, this, the definition is very similar. And I'm not sure whether you are familiar with that. Some of you are, I'm sure. So the definition is very similar. You take the, the space of circles in the space, but now instead of considering any kind of membranes, you just consider annuli. An annulus is just a circle times the intervals. So this is an annulus. You can make it out of a piece of paper, a band just reconnecting it with itself. So the difference doesn't seem all that deep. Here you allow the membrane to be any kind of surface. Here you only allow this very specific type of surface. But it turns out that in algebra, the difference will be rather drastic. This is always an abelian group. This might not be. In fact, for the genus G surfaces, this is given by the following group presentation. It has two G generators and a single relation, which is just the product of the commutators. If these notions are alien to you, it's okay. We, don't, we will not use them. But uh, I just mentioned that from, from any group, you can go to its abelianization, namely you can factor out with the commutator subgroup. And indeed, you get back the homology. So, Although there are some slight variations in the, in the definition, but you should notice that there is more information here than there. Somehow we can go from here to there, but we, can, but we, we might not be able to recapture pi 1 from h1. Nevertheless, when you work, you, you know, in mathematics it's always like a game. Like the more information is captured, you expect the object to be more complicated. So sometimes you sacrifice a little information for the sake of having an invariant which is easier to work with. Um, okay, so, um, so what happens in dimension three? In dimension three, so suppose M is compact and oriented, then there is a classification or more precisely, a description of, of three-dimensional manifolds. And pi 1 plays a crucial role. And I will not explain what this description is. I just remind you that probably you know, a few years back, you heard about the big revolution which happened by the work of Perelman, who proved that, in fact, there is a single three-manifold which has the fundamental group which is the same as the one for the three sphere. And this is the three sphere. So that was sort of the starting point, And with the same technique, they got a pretty good understanding of three manifolds. OK, so we know something about manifolds. But as the title suggests, I would like to talk about four manifolds. And for four manifolds, here is a theorem, which goes back to the work of Mike Friedman from 
1982, and it says the following. So suppose that M1 and M2 are two closed oriented four manifolds. And just to take away this algebraic complexity coming from the first uh, homotopy group, the, the fundamental group, we also assume that those are zero. Such objects are called simply connected. Then um, M1 and M2 are homeomorphic. So notice for the surfaces, we can say that the two surfaces are homeomorphic if and only if the first homology groups are isomorphic or the fundamental groups are isomorphic. A very similar statement follows here, saying that uh, two four-manifolds, um, well, I, I want to assume that these are both smooth, but that's not a very restrictive, that's not such an important assumption, but just it's important enough to make the statement true. Otherwise, it's not true, but it's like very close to be true. So they are homeomorphic if and only if, and now I sort of un introduce a new notion, Their cohomologies are isomorphic. So we agreed on what the first homology is. The first homology is the space of circles up to this membrane equivalence. Of course, the same notion generalizes it for any dimensional homology. The i-th homology is that you take a, a topological space, you consider all the i-dimensional surfaces or i-dimensional manifolds in it, and two are considered to be equivalent if there is an I plus one dimensional membrane between them. So homology makes sense in every dimension. And the star down here would mean that I sum them up. But now I put the star up there because instead of taking the homologies, I would like to take their duals. So I would like to consider maps on these I dimensional subspaces. And you might ask, why is it better to, t to go to the dual space? Usually, if you work with a vector space, the dual is the same dimensional vector space. But usually, the making a dual brings you an extra structure. Namely, if you, if you have some vector space and you take the dual, you take the maps mapping from the space to, say, R or Z, then these dual elements can be multiplied. Right? So instead of having a vector space, now you acquire some kind of a new algebraic structure, a ring structure. And indeed, the theorem says that the two objects are homeomorphic if and only if the two cohomologies are isomorphic as rings. So we need a little more than in surfaces. We need the, all the homologies and we need that extra structure. And as you might expect, this is a pretty deep theorem, and I wouldn't dare to even comment on the proof of how it goes, but this is what we will use. And so I tried to explain what manifolds and what four manifolds are. Now we have to explain what exotic means. So I'm not sure if change D to be something as like complex numbers. You, you, can, you, can, you can put any abelian group, and the notion makes sense you will lose the equivalence. Uh -huh. Somehow, the, really, the, the ring structure is very much sensitive for what happens over Z. If you put Z2 or the rationals, then you lose some kind of information. There is a, what's called a universal coefficient theorem, which is a theorem which tells you how to go from, from Z to any other, and then you might lose some information. Um, OK, so exotic. So definition. Two smooth manifolds. X and Y are called an exotic pair if X is homeomorphic. to y, but they are 
not diffeomorphic. So we know what homeomorphic means. There is a continuous map between x and y, which is one-to-one -one and continuous in both directions. Diffeomorphic is a very special homeomorphism. So we have smooth manifolds, so differentiability makes sense, and we are looking for a homeomorphism which is differentiable in both directions. So somehow, loosely speaking, you could say that homeomorphism means that the continuous functions are the same on the two spaces, right? So here is x and here is y and there is a homeomorphism. So if you have, all kind, if you have a, a continuous map, you can pull it back or you can push it forward because there is also an inverse. So somehow there is a, there is a good matching between continuous functions. But saying that they are not diffeomorphic, you expect that the differentiable functions are different. This is exactly the violation of this uniqueness principle. So, of course, the standing question is whether such pairs exist. Why do I call them, you know, exotic pairs? Somehow this word exotic is a relative notion, like Hawaii is pretty exotic when you view it from here. But if you are happening to be in Honolulu, then Budapest is very exotic. And, you know, except with a few exceptions, like New York is not exotic because you saw them on movies so many times. But most of these relations are come in pairs. So they, they are exotic relative to each other. And so the goal of this lecture is actually to produce you a pair of exotic, exotic manifolds. Of course, to prove exoticness is a very hard issue. And I will just hint how to do that. And also, I, would, I will modify a little bit this setup. And instead of working with manifolds, I will work with manifolds with boundary. But that's sort of a minor adjustment. But before doing that, let me just give you a few historic facts. So the first exotic pair was discovered by Milner, John Milner, in 1956. And he found a pair x and the th seven-dimensional sphere. So this is sort of a standard. This is like New York. You know, it's a reference manifold. And so x is called an exotic sphere. And shortly after, in fact, in a very surprising sequence of papers, Milner, together with Carver, just understood all exotic spheres. Well, all, if n is at, at least 5. So he proved that, for example, in five dimensions, there is no exotic pair which involves S5. So somehow, for the five-dimensional sphere, the uniqueness holds. For the seven-dimensional, it does not. And there are exactly 27 exotic spheres. Spheres. So if you put the standard sphere there, then you have 28 different spheres. And they happen to form a group. And they studied the group structure. And this is exactly what happens in any dimension, at least five. There are finitely many exotic spheres. They all form a group, and they describe the sizes of these groups. And we know really what happens, except in n equals 4, this theory doesn't say anything. So we'll get back to that. Um, if dimension is less than or equal to 3, then there is no exoticness. Then this uniqueness principle applies, as I alluded to, you know, there you sort of understand what the topological manifolds are, and they are all, they all admit uh, differentiable structures, and the differentiable structures are practically unique. So our principle works nicely in these low dimensions. The four, I leave it open for a moment, and then after that, there are all kinds of complications, but the complications are pretty much dealt with. So somehow we understand how many are, 
and we do understand or we have examples of manifolds which do not have smooth structures but the, uh, the, the understanding is, is okay and here's another theorem which one? It's the, the uh, so somehow like this, the group of exotic spheres. Oh, okay. So how is it? So, you know, pi 7 of Sn is called the homotopy group of sphere. And the title of the paper where they classified is called the uh, group of homotopy spheres. So it's like you just have the same words. You permute and you get something completely different. Um, but so these theta n's are understood except when n is 4 then we have no idea. So let me just recall one more theorem. So uh, if x is a smooth manifold homeomorphic to Rn and n is not equal to 4 then x is diffeomorphic and for a while people thought that okay the proof of this statement doesn't apply for n equals 4 but maybe the statement is true and this is not the case but R4, for R4, there are uncountably many uh, exotic manifolds. By which I mean there are uncountably many distinct four manifolds, all homeomorphic to R4, but none of them are diffeomorphic to R4, neither to each other. So if you think a little bit, that's pretty disturbing, no? So what do physicists do? So like they take the space-time, which is like R4, and they examine particles moving there. And what do they do with the particles? First, they measure the velocity, which is the derivative, and then the acceleration, which is sort of the second derivative. And it should depend on which smooth structure they take. Well, there is a canonical one, R4, but why is it canonical? Because you can define it in the same way as for Rn, but there is no good reason. So you might think that, you know, the Higgs bosons are much easier to appreciate if you take an exotic smooth structure. I don't know. I mean, there is no, I don't know any serious result about this direction, like how to get a good hand on exotic structures on R4. But we know that there are, and actually there are not only infinitely many, there are uncountably many. Okay, but this is like a... Say it again. I don't know. So the problem is you would think that like you take, so usually what happens with these exotic R4s that if you go towards infinity then they become wider and wider, wobblier and wobblier and so you would expect that if you know that you cut down a large sphere and it's an S3 then it's an R4 but it's not known and it is connected to the not knowing what happens on the sphere. So I'm sure that of course, I can tell you some super technical conditions, but it's not better than saying that it's actually diffeomorphic to R4. But nothing which is like, you know, so visible. Um, okay. So, nevertheless. Um, what I mean is, can the physicists prove that they live in R4? I don't think they really care. You know? <laughs> So, and, you know, on some level, I absolutely understand that. But from a mathematician's point of view, it's very disturbing. But, uh, no, locally, I mean, what can they measure? They can measure everything locally. And locally, an exotic R4 looks exactly like, or standard R4. It becomes interesting when you patch the charts together and you go all the way to infinity, and then comes a problem. Um, okay, so, well, how to construct such pairs? How 
to construct a pair, an exotic. So there are many standard uh, techniques to, to, uh, to construct exotic four-manifold pairs. And as I already pointed out, I, for a while I, I considered closed manifolds. And now, to make things a little simpler, I will turn to manifolds with boundary. So, uh, a manifold with boundary is a topological space where each uh, point has a neighborhood uh, homeomorphic to Rn or Rn plus which is just the upper half plane. So somehow a manifold with boundary. So this is the definition. And I just want you to keep the picture in mind that a manifold, a two-dimensional manifold, is something I already described. And the two-dimensional manifold with boundary is when you have a circle boundary. So these points don't have a neighborhood which looks like the plane, but they do have a neighborhood which looks, looks like the half plane. And this is what we generalize. Instead of planes, I say n-dimensional spaces and, and have n-dimensional space. OK, so these are manifolds with boundary. And then the name of the game is the same. We would like to have smooth charts. And the question is, can we, can we pick two different? Um, I will tell you what is the, the relevant formulation of Friedman's result. But before doing that, let me just give you a way to build four dimensional manifolds. So here is a constructive method. How to construct, well, before exotic pairs, how to construct four manifolds. So here is my claim, or here is one, one uh, idea. So suppose that K is a knot. Well, this should be easy to picture. So S3 is, is the three-dimensional sphere, which is like or three-dimensional space plus a point at infinity. Exactly the relation between the plane and the sphere, or the line and the circle. So a knot is just a knotted piece of rope inside S3. It's topologically, it's an S1, a circle. So it's like your your shoelaces when they are knotted, but then at the last moment you just glue the two ends together. It doesn't make your life easier because then you cannot untie your shoes. But this is not the point of having knots. So whenever you have a knot, I will associate to it a manifold with boundary, a four-dimensional manifold with boundary, which I will call xk. And the procedure is the following. Consider d4, the four-dimensional disk. These are vectors of length 1. Uh, length at most one in R4, and consider D2 cross D2. These are perfectly fine four-dimensional manifolds, and they both have boundaries, right? And now I will take a map, let phi be a map from part of the boundary to the boundary, such that phi is exactly k. So now this would be the time to give you a nice four-dimensional picture. But because of my shortcomings, I will do it in dimension 2, which sort of gives you a, uh, an idea. And I hope that will be enough. So let's see. So I would like to build a two-dimensional manifold starting with D2. And with D1 cross D1, I divide every dimension by 2. So D1 cross D1 is just a little rectangle, right? It's D1 in this direction and D1 in that direction. And I would like to specify a knot here. Well, the knot in the boundary so the boundary of D2 is now S1, 
and inside the boundary I would like to specify a knot, so I have to reduce dimension, which is now I will symbolize it by two points. This is like the zero-dimensional sphere, and for some odd reason the zero-dimensional sphere is not one point, it's just two. It makes perfect sense if you take the unit length vectors in R, right? It's minus one and one, and not only one. Okay, so uh, this is my knot. And now I've, I have to have a map which maps, so phi, now phi will become psi, okay? Just not to confuse. So we take the boundary of the first component cross the other. So the boundary of the first component are these two points. So cross the other, we have this portion of the boundary. And psi goes from the yellow region into here, such that the boundary of the first component cross the origin, which are these two points, should go here. Right? So you take this piece of this, this band and you just glue it like this. And you got something which is a two-dimensional manifold made out of uh, the sphere and one band. And we do the same. Notice that there is a little issue here because there are essentially two ways to glue that band. So I drew one and there is another way of doing the same business, but now you glue it like this. Do you see that? And then instead of an annulus, you get a Möbius band. Somehow the orientation is, is an issue. And so in order to make it precise, you have to fix an additional data. It's not enough to tell you where the middle points go, but you also have to specify me where one other point goes. And so say, when I say this, then I either screwed up. Yeah, I screwed up. If you, if you require that, then you get this one. And if you require the other, that it goes to the other side, then you get that one. Similarly, in dimension four, you also have to specify what happens with this cross one. This will go to a nearby knot, k prime, and you require that the k prime will go around k exactly minus one times. In the two-dimensional case, you have two choices. In the four-dimensional case, you have Z choices. And I just picked this because that will be convenient. But the operation which I will tell you would work with any integer, but we stick to minus one because it makes our life easier. But I still didn't tell you how to, okay. So I sort of told you how to do it in dimension four and you do the same in dimension, how to do it in dimension two and we do the same in dimension four. Um, we just take d4 union d2 cross d2 and factor by a, an equivalence relation that x and phi x should be identified. This is what it means on a, in a topological language to glue the two topological spaces together. And the result, if you do it with, with, with a knot k, is called xk. You clearly see that in dimension two, it will be a manifold which has boundary. If you do the oriented gluing, then you will have two S1 components. If you do the unoriented, then you will get a single S1. In the four dimensional case, the boundary will be some three manifold. So now our aim is to, uh, to get exotic pairs. So first of all, you might think that it's a very obscure construction, but in fact, it's not. Every four manifold, say every compact four manifold, can be given by a sequence of such handle attached, such constructions. Sometimes you have to switch from D2 cross D2, you, you have to allow D1 cross D3, 
and D3 cross D1, and D0 cross D4, and D4 cross D0. So you get all kind of different partitions of four into two bunch of numbers, and then you do this construction, and every four manifold can be given like that. Every smooth, compact four manifold. So it's not something really obscure, it produces everything. Uh, but we would like to produce a, a pair of exa an exotic pair. Can you tell how many steps you take? Is that a natural example? Like, the, like for the surfaces in the genus, right? It's a yes. For four manifolds, guess. It's not known. So there is a lower bound. The homology, as you will see, gives you a lower bound. But whether it is sufficient, we don't know. We suspect that it's not. Um, no. Okay. I, I, you know, what I don't know is something, but I think it's not known. Okay. Uh, so here is the, the theorem prime of Friedman. That, so first of all, yeah, before saying that, age upper star of x, k, z, now it has a boundary, so we have to do this relative version. And it turns out to be a very simple ring. It's, it's the ring of polynomials in a generator of degree 2 divided by an ideal. So it's just a fancy way of saying that it's z plus z plus z. So there is a constant, a first, and a quadratic term, and nothing after. So it doesn't depend on k. This, this one has to do something with the minus one we picked here. So somehow the homology will be the same, but of course you cannot expect that the x k's will be all homeomorphic based on Friedman's theorem. So Friedman's theorem here reads as follows. x k one and x k two are homeomorphic if and only if the cohomology rings k one are isomorphic, but they are all, plus the boundary three manifolds are homeomorphic. So we need something from the boundary and from the relative, and then you put them together. And this is, again, a very deep theorem of Friedman. So in order to get some pair of manifolds which are potentially exotic, we should look for k1 and k2 for which this condition holds. So I will just give you the two nodes, and I will spend some time on explaining why they are not diffeomorphic. That's the, somehow the, the real issue. So now comes the drawing part of the lecture. So not to screw up things too much. I will use my notes. So, you know, I went to a lecture of Raoul Bott, and he said that if you want to lecture about knots, there is one knot you are supposed to draw, and that's the trefoil. So if you like knot theory, go home and practice. And there are two trefoil knots. This is the right-handed, and there is the left-handed. And the difference is that once you draw with your right and the other one with your left hand. And you can see that they are the mirror images of each other. This is a different knot. So we, we will not use that, but I want them to be on the board because in some remote way we are talking about knot theory. And so this will be my K1. And now I want to draw K2. Um, And now instead of drawing, I will just put a box here. And this just means that I will take four full left twists. So I just turn it four times to the left. So a full left twist is something like this, right? And you have to repeat it four times. So there are just too many drawings, and that symbolizes this. So these are these two knots. The claim is that boundary of x, k1 
is homeomorphic to boundary of x k2. This is not something very complicated. I sort of sketched the proof, but I will not talk about this today. It needs a little sort of adjustment to this, this, this calculus, this way of presenting four manifolds and how to manipulate them, not to change the boundary. It's not complicated, but we will not go into that. So they are perfectly nice pairs, candidates of homeomorphic four manifolds. And now the question is, how can we tell that they are not diffeomorphic. What is the property which distinguishes them? And the slogan I would like to convince you about is that the property which distinguishes them is that the same homology classes can be represented by different surfaces. So how, how to make it, how to make this sentence alive? So, um, distinction, so H2 of XK1 is the same as HK2 of H2 of XK2 and both are isomorphic to Z and so we pick a generator here and we pick a generator there if there is a homeomorphism or a diffeomorphism, it takes generator to generator. And I would like to convince you that uh, for K2, there is a map F. An embedding which represents it's a smooth map. Why? But there is no which represents x. So, you know, I sort of try to convince you that the difference between the smooth structures, the differentiable structures, that the differentiable functions from the manifold are different. And now I would like to show an example which is sort of the same idea, but now we are examining manifolds into the, we are examining smooth functions, C infinity functions, C infinity many times differentiable functions into the manifold. And I claim that for xk2, there is a differentiable function from S2, which represents this generator, and there is no such function from there. So they cannot be the same. Somehow they are fundamentally different. Their smoothness is fundamentally different. This I really would like you to understand. And this one I will quote some big theorems. But so how to, how to see spheres in four manifolds, right? This is the question. Well, let me try to sort of go back to my two-dimensional picture. So remember, schematically, we do this. This is the two-dimensional version of the same, same construction. How do we want to see spheres? What, what dimensional spheres? Well, in this case, we are looking for S1s, circles. So this is the strategy. Within this band, there is this core, the middle line, and this gives us a half of a circle. It's an arc, right? And then I would like to finish it off. How can I picture a, a, an arc inside this D2? Imagine, you know, of course, for us, three-dimensional human beings, it's very simple. You just draw it and you see it. But imagine that you are like this little bug which, which moves, so this is you moving around the circle. You are a one-dimensional guy and you would like to picture at, uh, an arc inside this two-dimensional thing. You cannot just view it from above because you cannot move out of your little circle. So for this guy, this makes a perfect sense. This is a knot. And it also makes sense to take a knot somehow on a circle with smaller radius. radius. And you can actually imagine that you have a 
whole family of circles and on each and every circle you have a knot, you have a pair of points and if you are lucky they will really comprise to an arc. So this is the philosophy we will do. Remember xk is d4 union d2 cross d2 so we would like to see an S2, a two-dimensional sphere. So we have half of the sphere inside there. It's the sort of the upper hemisphere of the surface of the globe, but we would like to see something inside this D4. So we have this sequence, so this is my D4, we have this sequence of smaller and smaller radii spheres, and we have knots, of course, the knots, what I draw, are always dots, and they will comprise to a disk, right? So, I claim that starting from this guy, we'll see that. We'll see something very similar to this picture. So, what does it mean? I, I should, pr now I should provide you a movie. A movie where every at every moment you see something in the three space, right? Every slice in this movie is a three-dimensional image of a knot or link, a knot or, or, or more components. So let's start with this picture. So expect a movie. Not that exciting as you usually see, but you don't know the end, of course. This is very annoying, actually. Does it, does it actually help? Can you hear me better? Or this goes into the, the thingy, I see. It's just to make you more uncomfortable. Yeah, that's okay. So here, here's the movie. So the movie starts with like, I don't know, usually what does it start? Telling the name of the director or something. So you start here and nothing happens. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And suddenly, it will, you, you will see the two characters. They will appear as points, right? And in my case, they will appear as two points. Actually, I want to position them like this. So before that, it's like nothing? Yeah, it's like, you know, read the Bible. How does it start? There is nothing, right? And then, and then creation happens and then things. So, but look at this picture. There is no intersection. In the three space, you see the three space and there is nothing relevant. You don't go into the middle point, right? Yeah, you can always avoid a point, right? So, yeah. so suddenly it will touch one or more, suppose we arrange it in touching or surface in two points, right? So the two characters arise and then you, you, you go further in time and then these points become circles. Circles and then the circles start to dance around. Imagine that it's like Romeo and Juliet, right? So, you know, they start to dance and so now I will, pre I will describe how they dance. You still see the two circles, right? They are like two plain unknotted circles, but in this special position. So we are, we are going, you know, we are somewhere here. And then they dance a little more. So next, next move is like this. Still nothing happened. Well, but this is the time they go to the, what, what is it, the friar? You know, they go to church and they get united or something. So this is when, instead of having these four dots, at this moment, something miraculous happens. Instead of four, you will get two. So instead of a two component link, two knots, you will get one link. You add the band and you can add the band in any way you like. What you will get, so you will end the band here just to construct these this four left twists and so on. I will not draw, so you will get a four twist. So what did you do? What is the surface you created? Well, you started with two dots and as the dots acquired these little circles, you tried to build these D2s, these disks. And suddenly you have now two substantial disks 
So topologically, you have something like this. And suddenly, when they go to the fryer, they get the band. Right? They are connected with the band. But now, if you have two disks and you connect them by a band, you get the disk. You get the single disk. So this movie actually described you a disk with two minimums somehow, two minima. These two points were the two minima. And on the boundary, when you go all the way up, you will exactly see that, that knot. OK, so we checked this. And now we would like to convince ourselves that the, this statement is also true. There is no such embedding of the sphere into xk1. Well, that's considerably harder. The first idea would be that you try the same trick and, and you, don't, you don't manage to do that. It's impossible. But that's not enough, right? It would show that in xk2, there is no sphere which has this very special property that it passes through very nicely in this addition and it's some have this down here. But nobody said that you are looking for such spheres. You are looking for spheres, period. And the sphere might happen to go 55 times around and do all kinds of crazy things and you know, it, it could be positioned in a completely different way. And the statement is that still it doesn't exist and well, this non-existence follows from a string of uh, so rather involved arguments, which I will just outline here. So step one is that xk1 is not only a smooth manifold, but you can assume that it has a complex structure. So is complex, by which I mean that it has charts which are not homeomorphic to R, R4, but only to C2, and the transition functions are complex differentiable functions. We know that it's much stronger. So this is complex. So uh, therefore, it has a distinguished class which is called the first churn class in its second cohomology. And now I will not tell you how this is defined, but the main role of this class is the next is the, what's called the adjunction inequality is that C1 evaluated on X in absolute value plus x times x is always at most twice the genus of any surface representing x minus 2. So then I, I'm not, I don't say anything how it is derived, but notice that this, this term can be identified with the minus one we chose at the beginning. I don't explain how, but once you accept that, we are done, because this is an absolute value. So we don't know what the value is, but it's non-negative. So this whole thing is at least minus one. So you put the minus two over there, and you get two, one is less than twice the genus of any surface. And so that shows that g cannot be equal to zero, so the surface cannot be S2. So in the last maybe two or three minutes, I sort of took a quantum leap. And I went into, you know, from 1982, as in Back to the Future, we went to 19, no, well, 2000 and some, 2004. So this formula is based on a very uh, delicate theory called uh, cyber witten theory, which is somehow related to solutions of partial differential equations on, on smooth manifolds. And uh, what I would like you to take out of that is that this kind of questions, which I outlined here, like existence of exotic pairs, involve little pieces of a lot of different branches of mathematics. It requires some kind of a knot theory when you make constructions. 
but it also uses the classical algebraic topology through Friedman's work. But when you want to prove something really exciting, you need a little complex analysis. And in here, there is geometric analysis. And in particular, partial differential equations. So again, I don't want to go into the details of that. And I think my time is up anyhow. So. And I just want to question, if you had to say one sentence about the inequalities, what would you say? So then I would say that if you have a complex manifold, and you have a complex submanifold, say it's a complex, complex two-dimensional, so real four, and it's a complex curve, so a real two-dimensional object, then with this C1, indeed, you get an equality. So for complex submanifolds, you get C1 of C plus C times C dot C, which is some homological intersection, is exactly twice G minus two. So this is what's called the adjunction formula. And this uh, inequality says that if you leave the realm of complex submanifolds, but the ambient space is complex and you take smooth submanifolds, you cannot decrease the genus. And the genus is like the price of the, of the, of the submanifolds, so smooth cannot be cheaper than complex. Complex is somehow optimal. And that's what it expresses, but of course the way you prove it goes through a lot of analysis and, uh, and we, we'll just skip that. Um, that's what I would say if I have one sentence. If I have more, then I would say something else. Hopefully not contradicting this one. Any other questions? Is there like a simple sort of explanation for why the milner curve stuff breaks down? Here? Is this with the theta n? Or why, why it shouldn't necessarily work before? Well, you want the philosophy? Sure. The philosophy is that somehow, so, we know why the proof breaks down. Yeah. And yeah, we don't yeah. know whether the fact is true or false. We don't know. I, I wanted to finish the lecture by saying that whether there are exotic pairs involving S4, not known. This is like the simplest thing you get from R4. You just, you just add one more point. Then you say, ah, yeah, we add one more point, but we lose lots of structure. Like for C, C2, you cannot do that. You can compactify C2 by taking the line at infinity and the, point, the ideal point of the line at infinity, and you get the complex projective plane. Whether it admits an exotic friend, we don't know. It comes with a, an orientation. We can reverse it. We get CP2 bar, not known. But if you take CP2 and you add, you, know, you can connect some manifolds in some way, you get N of those then if n is at least two, then we have exotic structures on those. So these guys, where n is at least two, they do have exotic friends. What happens for n equals one? What happens for CP2? What happens for the basic compact four manifold? We don't know. But getting back to your question, what breaks down? Well, there is this famous theorem um, proved by Smale in the early 60s which is called the h cobordism theorem, which practically says that in higher dimensions, algebra dictates geometry, which says that if you have two submanifolds of complementary dimension, and there are some algebraic assumptions, and they intersect each other in a way that you ass assign signs to it, and they don't have to intersect them. Algebra doesn't force them to, be, to, to intersect each other because they, the multiplicities cancel. Then, in fact, you can move them apart. And the way you do it is you go from this point to there on a loop. You go there on another. It's not a loop. You go an interval, and then you go back, and you get the loop. The loop will bound a disk. This is these extra additional assumptions. And using that disk, you can sort of slide this guy away from the other. Um, and that works perfectly in dimension four, except in higher dimensions, if you have the image of a disk, it can be always assumed to be embedded because you have enough dimensions. But in dimension four, a two disk will intersect each other itself. Like if you have a, 
a circle in the plane, then it will typically intersect each other if you have intersect itself. If you have the same circle in R3, then by a tiny, tiny bit of movement, you just lift a little bit, and this will be embedded. So in dimension four, there will be some self-intersection. So you want to rectify that and take a little loop here and put a disk there, but that will still intersect each other. And in this way, you get this infinite sequence of disks. And this is how you prove actually Friedman's theorem. So this is what he was able to do if you assume, uh, if you don't assume smoothness, only topological, this is how he derives his results after a lot of suffering. And I can tell you a lot, and I can tell you it's suffering. But uh, this is the point where things break down if you go to dimension four. The essence is that, unfortunately, two by two is not less than four. We wish it would be like by a tiny bit or something, but it's not. But this equality holds if 4 is substituted with something higher. OK? And let me just take another shot. So you take these SONs, and these groups, the orthogonal groups, are usually simple groups, except in one dimension, n equals 4. Is it a coincidence? I don't know. I mean, when God was creating the word, I mean, either he fell asleep or he did it intentionally. But n equals 4 is really, really, really different. And actually, so this is practically SO3 cross SO3. And this is the origin of all these PDEs. This is where the analysis comes from. So everything sort of matches, but we still don't understand the complete picture. 